to Matthew chapter 26. I believe last week we made it as far as verse 56. We're in the last hours of Jesus before the cross. We looked at the betrayal and the arrest last week. In the garden... Interesting, isn't it? There's two gardens spoken of in the Bible. One, the Garden of Eden, and the other one, the Garden of Gethsemane. In one, man falls, and another one, redemption for man, is begun. That process of being obedient. One falls because of disobedience. One is becoming obedient in the most amazing way. As he goes through some temptation time, he cries out to his father. We see in Luke that he was strengthened by an angel. And as he sees those who are coming to arrest him, there's a tone change from uh, the stress of what he's about to face to Kind of the conquering king, he's, he's going to do ultimately the father's business uh, at the cross. And he wakes up his disciples and says they're, they're coming. And then one of the disciples, and we know from one of the other gospels that it was Peter, draws a sword, takes off the ear of Malchus and Jesus, even and then to show his control of this whole situation. As chaotic as it sounds, and sometimes... I kind of even get caught up in the chaos of that moment. I mean, you have hundreds of men who have come to arrest Jesus, to arrest one man. Um, You could, you could probably justify that knowing the the number and the, the size of the crowds that Jesus would draw from time to time. And the fact that at this time at Passover time, Jerusalem's, uh, uh, the number of people in Jerusalem would would swell to sometimes over two million people. So it would it would be under, understandable that you might face more than just Jesus and and his closest. Although Judas would certainly know that that's all that was with him because he was with him at the beginning of the evening. And he brings them out, and the other thing I find here to to that reminds me of the garden is the question that's asked. So remember in the garden after Adam had fallen, he hears the footsteps of the Lord coming to him and God calls out to Adam. He doesn't just you know pick up the branch and say, yeah, I know you're there, which he obviously knew where he was. But he says, where are you? Have you eaten from the tree? It's not that God didn't know. He's giving Adam opportunity to confess and repent from his sin. And right away, Adam goes to the blame game, right? It's the woman that you gave me. So, you know, if it's not enough that it's the woman, God, you're the one. You played a part in this fall, too, and and wants to blame God. He's not taking any responsibility at all. But we see him ask a question of Judas. Have you, friend, why have you come? He's giving Adam. Judas an opportunity to confess right now. You can confess right now and you can repent right now. But he doesn't. He hands him over. He identifies him. They take him. In the next scene, we see Jesus standing in a, a trial that is not even a legal trial. They were not supposed to hold a trial at night, especially not for a capital crime. And for a capital crime, they had to have two corroborating witnesses. That they had to take them, they couldn't question them at night, and they had to take them and question them in separate places. They couldn't bring everybody in. And here it seems, as we as we look at this, this scene, it's going to seem like 
these trumped up witnesses, these fake witnesses are, are lined up to come in and testify in front of everybody. And so we look at verse 57, it says, And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away uh, to Caiaphas and the high priest, uh, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him, followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it? These men testify against you. But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, It is as you, as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, uh, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the, who is the one who struck you? So we have this, this seating, they're at, they're at Caiaphas, they're going to stay at Caiaphas, they're going to end up going to Annas. One was the, the high priest according to Jewish law, the other was appointed by Rome. Uh, usually when you're the high priest, you were supposed to be the high priest for life, but Rome said, yeah, we're only going to let you go so far with your control and, and, and the, the, what they considered religious or political figureheads. You're only going to be able to have so much influence. We'll, we'll appoint our own people to those positions. And they became very corrupt, just like the tax collectors who, who were collecting from their own brethren. The high priests, as we know, became very corrupt in that system and and in that appointment. But they're at the they're at this place, and now Peter, we've already looked at Judas. Now Peter is following him, but he's following at a distance. This is Peter who said, If you die, I'm dying. I'll be with you, I'll be right beside you all the way, Lord. This there's no way you're getting away from me. And yet, when it came down to it, Peter leaves like everybody else does. They all flee that situation, the arrest scene. So Jesus is standing there alone. And yet Peter is close enough that he can see what's going on. And he follows the, the, the entourage back to, uh, to Caiaphas. And he, he's able to get in. And we see in one of the other gospels because one of the other disciples gets him in. And it's thought that it's probably John. Because it would seem that John's family had ties to the high priest family, relation or, or, or otherwise. Somehow they were tied to that family. John was able to get in. So Peter is able to get in. And uh, so you have, now you have two witnesses going into this. The only two who are going to be able to corroborate this story correctly. All the other witnesses in this, in this story are false witnesses. Matthew's telling us they were all false witnesses, everybody that came in. There's going to be false testimony, all kinds of different accusations uh, put up to Jesus, but they, they can't even carry out their own plot. They can't carry out their own, uh, their own desires because they can't get two to agree until finally, at the end, two people step up and say, well, he, well, he said he would destroy the temple and on, in three days build it back up. And 
They said, well, what do you say to this? And Jesus is silent. Now, we know that's a fulfillment of, pri- of prophecy, that he was going to be uh, like a sheep before the shepherd is silent when he's being, or before the shearer is silent. Jesus would be silent according to all the accusations, except for then the high priest puts him under an oath. Jesus had to answer at this point because if he didn't, he would be breaking the law. This is part of the Mosaic law. If they put them under this oath before God to answer, then they had to answer. And so Jesus just says, yeah, it's, it's as you say. But let me push your button a little bit more. Hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. He's saying the next time you see me, the tables are going to be turned. The true power will be with me and not with you. You think you have power, Caiaphas. And he's even going to say that specifically to Pontius Pilate. You think you have power, but you guys, you have no power except for what the Father lets you have. Because this has to be done. This has to be done. You know, I don't know about you guys, but Sunday morning seems to be the hardest morning at our house to get everybody around and get everybody going in the same direction to make sure everybody's dressed right and teeth are brushed and hair is combed and done and makeup is on and and it gets a little tense and sometimes there's some bickering and sometimes there's even, hey, fall in line or else kind of thing. Everybody seems to be have a harder time waking up on Sunday morning than they do any other any other day of the week. And and I'm sure it's the same to one extent or another in one way or another in everybody's house on Sunday morning. Listen, the, the enemy does not want us to come together. He doesn't want us to come and, and read his word. But at the root of that, why it's so easy to agitate us is because we're all selfish. We're all looking out for ourselves. To one degree or another, we're looking out for ourselves. And we will turn like wild dogs on the ones that we love for ourselves over stupid little things. And so as this is kind of brewing in my house this morning, and it wasn't terrible. I don't want to give the impression that we're screaming and yelling and chucking things at each other. It's just, you know, that that aggravation. One wants to get out the door. One's not too concerned with about getting out the door. You know, it's just, it's just all of that. You're not exactly on the same page. And so we have a, a chair in our bedroom, and I just sat down for a little bit. I thought, well, rather than just doing this and perpetuating it farther, I'm going to sit in here, and I'm going to let God deal with me because... I'm a part of all of that. It's not like I'm exempt from it or I wasn't participating in anything. But I needed to get my head on right before I came here to do this. And I'm thinking about that. How selfish I was being. And I'm going to have to stand up there and I'm going to talk about the most selfless act ever in all of human history. And I'm being selfish over petty things. And I'm clashing with other people who are being selfish over petty things. Keep in mind, and we already saw this last week, as, as, as Jesus is telling him to put the sword back, Peter, put it down. And we see in the other gospel, he picks Malchus's ear up and he puts it back on him. And Jesus said, listen, all I got to do is ask and the Father says, 12,000 angels and this place is toast. We go back to zero. That's all I need to do. I've wrestled with this. I've seen you guys sleeping. I'm sweating to the point of I'm bursting blood vessels in my skin and sweating blood now. That's what I mean when it says it kind of takes a different tone at that point. Jesus does. Think about the, if you're into 
guys, more action-packed movies where we see things blow up and whatever else, and we have our, our heroes or superheroes take a stand against the great evil that threatens the entire planet. And we hear the voice of Arnold Schwarzenegger or somebody else with their great one-liners that make everybody kind of cheer or fist pump or whatever. Yeah, the bad guy's going down kind of thing, right? The whole twist in the plot has taken a turn for the good. And the tough guy, nothing can beat him. This is what happens here. There's no guns. There's no explosions. But he has steadfastly turned to face the enemy, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. In fact, you all think you're taking this straight into where it needs to go, and you are, but not for your purposes. Because everybody involved in this, except for Jesus, is completely selfish. The high priests and the priests are doing this because they're tired of him having the attention of all the people. The Romans don't care. They're putting down a possible insurrection. Pilate's just trying to maintain who he is in the face of Rome because he's been getting in trouble over and over again in Rome. And his one great friend there that was keep, would keep getting him out of trouble has now been put to death by Caesar because he thought he was trying to take over. Everything is very superstitious and suspicious when it comes to Rome. The disciples, out of self-preservation, have fled and left Jesus to be by himself. Peter's just sneaking in to see. He just can't stay away. And everybody thinks they're winning. Well, except for the disciples. They think they've lost everything. Jesus is not being who he said he was going to be who we thought he was going to be. Let me correct that because he did, he is being and doing exactly what he said he was going to do. He's not being what they wanted him to be. The conquering king that was going to overthrow Rome and establish his kingdom. He's not being who Judas thought he was going to be. So Judas says, hey man, 30 pieces of silver and I'm out of this? Good, let's do it. Although you're going to see he has a change of heart too. Well, not a change of heart, change of mind. A guilty conscience that he doesn't, doesn't succumb to. Not in a positive way anyways. So we have all of this, and it seems very chaotic. You have, you have 72 men all whipped up into a frenzy. You have, that's being the, the Sanhedrin, convening at times that they don't want to convene, that they're not supposed to legally convene at, trying to trump up charges, which they seem to have been able to do. And then Jesus, when he gives an answer, they just shout blasphemy. And it doesn't even have to be true. It just has to be said. And it's all it took. These are not words of blasphemy because Jesus has proven who he is by his teaching, by the things that he's done. He holds them responsible, if you remember, for not knowing the day of their visitation. And because of that, in 70 AD, everything was going to be destroyed. The temple torn down and Jerusalem destroyed. It's not blasphemy. When John the Baptist would have his time of doubt, Jesus says, go and tell him. And he quotes a section from Isaiah about the blind seeing and the, the um, excuse me, and the deaf hearing and the dead raised and the, the captive set free. Tell John, you, you believe right. I am the one you believe me to be. He's proven over and over again that he was the Messiah. It's not blasphemy. We move on from the, his answer to the high priest tore his clothes, and we don't know if this is his priestly garment or just his own clothes, but he tears his clothes, which is a sign of mourning, and he gets super dramatic about all of this. He has spoken blasphemy. 
What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered him, or they answered and said, he is deserving of death. He should die. And then they spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palm of his hand, with the palm of their hands. And so many pressed in. And in another, one of the other gospels says they blindfolded him. They continue to beat him. And they, they say to him, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? None of this is legal. There's not one ounce of this, not one bit of what they're doing in their conduct and in the way they're carrying out the trial, in the setup of their trial, not one thing is legal. And yet they're going to hold him to, well, you answered us this way, so blasphemy, and oh, by the way, we want you to die. Verse 69 says, now Peter, he's outside, and the chaos is going to kind of roll into the outside. It says, now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came, came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out uh, to the gateway, another girl saw him and said, uh, to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied uh, with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those uh, who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you are, the, you are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately, the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. So he's in the courtyard, and it begins to get a little chaotic out there. And they're looking for witnesses. They're looking for people to come in and testify against Jesus. And the girl says, Hey, here's one right here. He was, he was there. And Peter says, no, now this is Peter's chance to not go testify against Jesus. This is Peter's chance to step up and testify for Jesus. Instead, he just says, I, I don't know what you're even saying. You're, you're out of your mind. I don't, I don't know that guy. And the second time, he's more adamant. I do not know him. He denied him with an oath. And the third time, he says he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. And that's not just a bunch of swear words tagged into a denial. That's Peter announcing what they would call an anath anathema on himself. May I be eternally damned if I know him. So let me ask you, how far can a person go and still know the grace of God? Did Judas still have an opportunity? Yeah. Peter's crossed the line. Listen, if you've grown up in the church, <laughs> you would be afraid to even hear somebody say that. If you've been a Christian for very long, you would not want to hear somebody say that who is even a lost person. There, there is a, a fear of God in us, hopefully, that would make us shake inside if we heard somebody say that. And not a fear of God because we're afraid that we're going to face the judgment of God, the wrath of God, because we won't if we're believers. But a fear of God knowing what we've escaped. And what, if that person doesn't turn, they will go into. But here's one who followed. Here's one who believed. But to preserve himself becomes so selfish that he will say, let me be eternally damned if I don't know the guy or if I know him.
something I forgot about these priests, speaking of how far can one go. They spit in his face. They hit him. They yell insults at him. Prophesy, Christ. Tell us who hit you. In Acts chapter 6, verse 7, it tells us that many priests came to faith in Jesus. Many of the priests would become believers. Many of these guys who spit in his face, can you imagine? How far can you go? How far does a person have to go before we are allowed to give up on them? Only God knows if a person will turn in his last moments like the thief on the cross. Or if he'll turn tomorrow and live out years with the Lord. Only God knows. We have examples set in front of us in in these last moments of, of Jesus' life of people who in a couple of days, in Peter's case, would be restored back and placed in a position of, of, of authority even among the disciples. Or the priests who have physically abused the Savior, started the beatings, lied about him, spit in his face. When I read that about him, that is the one thing as a kid would make me just go insane. That would make skinny little me ready to fight anybody if they were spit on me. There's just something about that 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 is such, it's way bigger than words. And it happened over and over again to Jesus. And he let it happen. The most selfless, putting us first. When, when we read this and we think about these things and we need to think about them, Then when we read other verses like, we love him because he loved us first. That's why we love him. Think about how far the love went. We have minimized the cross by our artwork. We have great artistry and all these things of a, of a, a Jesus who doesn't even look Jewish hanging on a cross with things glowing around him or bright colors. This was a dark, dark day. What we should see on the figures of the cross should be something that doesn't even look like a man anymore, according to Isaiah. We need to understand and remember, when you see these things, when you see, oh, they spit on him. Imagine somebody spitting on you and how, how quickly you would become unself-controlled. How quickly do you come to your own defense if you think somebody's lying about you? Or even just blowing things out of proportion. Maybe it's not a full-out lie. Maybe they're just exaggerating a situation or some details. How far out of control do you get? How fast? And our Savior is completely and totally self-controlled. The entire time, he takes the abuse physically and he takes the abuse emotionally, verbally. He just takes it. Another word that came to my mind this morning while I was thinking about this was propitiation. And sometimes it's it's put out there like, well, it means he paid the price. But if you look it up, it's a whole lot more than that. 
It's also the word that was used to describe the cover for the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. He's literally our mercy seat. And the other meaning that goes with it in Hebrews, the, the, the one that describes the mercy seat is mentioned two times in 1 John. And then in Hebrews, when it talks about it, it's not just the mercy seat, but also the priest. He is our, uh, he's our covering guys. We use that word very lightly. Do you understand what it means you're covered? What picture do you get in your mind when you think about God covering you? With a robe? Sometimes we'll say, well, I'm just going to pray a hedge of protection around me. What does that mean? A thorny bush? It's the mercy seat. When the Bible talks about us being covered by God, it is the mercy seat covered in his blood. He is both the sacrifice and the high priest that took it in. Once a year, one man could go in on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, with the blood from the sacrifice for the entire nation would take that and throw it on the mercy seat. Only one man. And he had to be so right before God that if he walked in with unrighteousness in his heart, dead. And nobody could go in and get him. But because they couldn't just leave him in there, obviously you're not going to leave a corpse in the Holy of Holies. They'd tie a rope around his ankle. So if he did fall over, they could pull him out. Secular tradition tells us that the Romans, when somebody would carry a cross, would tie a leather strap around their ankle. And on their way out to their place where they would be crucified, they would periodically yank their feet out from underneath them. So when we see here in the next couple of, you know, in the next chapter that Jesus falls and they take Simon of Cyrene and make him pick up his cross, it could be that they yanked his feet out from underneath him and he fell under the weight of the cross. At this point where we're at right now, Jesus hasn't even been scourged yet. But his own have taken him and tied him up and blindfolded him and beat him and humiliated him in whatever way they possibly could. And he's completely self-controlled. Now we look at the fruit of the spirit, right? In Galatians, and we talk about it being the fruits of the spirit. These things are the evidence that the spirit of God indwells you. The problem is it's fruit singular. Not really a problem. The list starts off with love. That's the fruit of the Spirit. All the rest of that is what love is. When we take the fruit of the Spirit and we put it on Jesus, all of it is what love is. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, all of those are listed in some form or fashion in what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Self-controlled. You guys, and you look at this, you're seeing the love of God in complete control. When everything else seems chaotic, he is in control. Working out what is needed for us. How does your life look to you right now? How are you doing with the selfishness part? How are you doing with the self-control part? Notice the same word is in both of those, selfishness and self-control. Are you being selfish or selfless? Hopefully more one than the other. Are you being self-controlled or are you out of control? Are you looking at your situation right now and in a self-preservation mode? rather than a submitted mode in front of God, letting him take care of the situation.
Is it what I want, no matter whatever else anybody else wants? In the name of I've, God will take care of them. I'm going and doing this. You know, I have a friend who's who kind of had that mentality in the ministry. And he was, he would go, he would do, he would study for hours and hours. And small church, so he, he had a job outside of the church. In one day, and I don't put the, the blame on him for this situation, but one day he comes home to marriage is out of control and a mess and he had just shoved it down and shoved it down and God will take care of it and God will take care of it. And while it's true, and it sounds right, and it is if your heart is right toward it, if you're willing to recognize, hey, there's some problems here, and you're going to put it in front of God, and you're willing to do whatever God tells you to do to deal with it. And when he came out of this, I said, dude, man, you haven't done anything really wrong. You stay humble before God. You can be back in the ministry in this. God will restore you. And he looked at me and said, never again. The price is too high. I didn't really count the cost of all this. So now he swung clear over to the other direction and overreacting in the other direction. And I love him. And I still think God could restore him into a ministry of some sort. I just don't know if he'll let it happen. He wasn't willing to do what it took to just recognize what was going on around him. And he just let it go and let it go and let it go until it blew up. And the accusation was you don't really care. I mean, that's the basis of the accusation he got. He let his wife be out of control. And it's, and it's heartbreaking. You know what? I'm going to say because of what we've read today, she's not really too far gone. I can't say that she is. I mean, my heart, where I'm at and, and, and what I can fully embrace and understand, I'm going, Lord, man, if you don't do something, she's never coming back. She was never really a part of this. In my heart, I go, Lord, man, the longer he waits, the farther away he's going to get. And I believe my brother will be in heaven with me, but Man, and I wish I could say that's the only story I've ever heard. If we don't learn to be like Jesus in this, Think about this. This is way worse than any of your situations right now. This is way worse than any situation I've faced. If we can't be this, if we can't look and go to this and say, Lord, this is how I want to be. Completely self-controlled by your power, your grace, your mercy, because of what you've poured out on me. I want to be able to do this for other people. I want to be able to pray for him and say, this is what I want for him, but Lord, not my will, but your will be done. 
This is what I want for me, but not my will, but your will be done. Man, a picture of complete submission to the Father, a picture of complete selfless act. How horrifying and beautiful at the same time. And I'm willing to admit I've been Peter too many times. The opportunity to testify for Jesus. And succumb to my own flesh and my own desires and what I want. To not walk up and say, I am really, I'm with you. You, you. Hang on to me so I don't fall back. I'm with you. Whatever it takes in this situation, Lord, I'm walking the way you want me to walk. And listen, too many, if you don't know the word of God, you don't know what it means. I know I've been on this and I'm going to work this into every message till the day I die, I think. You need to know God's word. You need to know the Bible. We are in a time of paraphrases and versions of the Bible that are only New Testaments. And look at how wonderful this sounds. Yeah, lay it over an actual translation and start studying it and see what it actually says. Listen, some of the paraphrases, I hear guys use them. I'm, I don't, but I, I hear guys use them. And at times, yeah, you know what? That regular everyday language kind of brings it down to where we can truly understand the passage. But it's not a translation. It's not what you should use for Bible study. You need a translation. I've never even read a paraphrase of this section, so I don't know how eloquent and how poetic they try to make it. But there's, this, this is just bad. This is hard. This is hold the mirror up in front of your face and say, there's me. I've been the guy spitting in his face. I've been the guy hitting him. I've been the guy out and out denying him saying, hey, if I know him, my actions have shown. If I've known him, then may I be eternally damned. I've had those days. We've all had those days if you're going to be willing to admit it. In verse 75 here where it says Peter remembered what Jesus said. In Luke it says he was close enough to Jesus to turn and look him in the eyes. And Jesus looked at him. And it means Jesus looked into him, not just looked at him. This was, in, this was that, that moment of seeing eye to eye. You look somebody in the eye. Parents, you, you you get good at this, don't you, when you you want to be able to communicate? Well, now you don't have to do it anymore because now you got cell phones and you can just text each other in the same room so the kids don't know the plan you're making, you know, to thwart their plan. But but used to be you could just look at each other and develop that. You, you know what the other one's thinking. Look into the eyes. Understand this. God knows. Jesus knows. He knows the depths of the sin of your heart. He knows the cruelty that you can express. He knows all of it. All of it. He knows all of it. You are not hiding one bit from him. And 
And yet he still finished the still finished it. He still went to the cross. He he looked at Peter, the one who boasted that he would be there to the bitter end. Like he's his, I am your man. I am your closest friend. And he watched him and he heard him do exactly what Jesus said he was going to do. And he looked him in the eyes and it crushes Peter. It says he went out and wept bitterly. When Jesus is resurrected, he tells Mary, go and tell my disciples that you've seen me. Go and tell them and Peter. Can you imagine delivering that message? You walk into the room, I've seen Jesus. He's alive. I promise you, he's alive. He said, come and tell his disciples. Here I am. Oh, and Peter, he said to tell you too. Maybe Jesus, when he sent her, just said, just knew Peter wasn't going to be with the rest of those guys at that moment. Jesus would go and appear to Peter by himself. Think about this. James and Jude, his half-brothers, the ones who wrote those books, didn't believe until the resurrection. And he went and appeared to them. His own family. In fact, I believe in John, one of them suggests, because they know there's a plot to kill him. One of them says, why don't you go up to Jerusalem? At one point, they come to take him away because they think he's crazy. He's betrayed by everybody. Verse 1 and 27 says, When morning came, and all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death, and when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, uh, the governor. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back 30 piece, the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful for... Uh, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they consulted uh, together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. And then, the, then was fulfilled uh, what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was, per, who was uh, pierced or priced, uh, whom they had, whom they, the children of Israel, uh, priced and gave them uh, for the gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. And so Judas now has his revelation. Thirty pieces of silver, guilt comes. Says he's remorseful, but he is not remorseful like Peter is. He's willing to say, I sinned by betraying innocent blood. Take your money back. And he thinks that's what's going to make it all well. That's what will make it better. I'm wrong. Here's, the, here's your price back. I'm just going to, I'm going to take it back. Like, you know, taking back the money made him innocent. He, would, he never got it. Judas never understood. It's like, I feel really horrible. This is bad. I'll just give the money back. Then everything will be okay. And they're like, what do we care? 
We don't care about your conscience. We don't care about your guilt. You deal with it. Okay? This is between you and God. Leave me out of it. I don't have nothing to do with this. And the betrayer is betrayed. And he can't deal with it. It says he went out and he hanged himself. He was remorseful, but he wasn't repentant. He tried to fix it in his own power. Peter has no ability to fix this. What's done is done in Peter's mind. I, what, I, can't, I can't do anything about this. Judas is the same way. I can't, I, I shouldn't have done this. But if I take the money back, I'll be forgiven. I'll be all right. Our own efforts to cover our own sin don't work. Peter will have to be completely submitted before Jesus. He will have to accept the grace of Jesus. He will come to understand that Jesus' blood was shed for him. He was a sacrifice for Peter. He has to embrace that sacrifice. Judas isn't doing that. Judas is trying to cover his own sin, cover his own tracks. There's no, where did you take him so I can go see him? There's no going into the temple with a sacrifice and saying, God, forgive me. This is going back to the evil and saying, here, I just don't want to be a part of this anymore. And just says, we don't care what you want to be a part of or not. You deal with it. And he can't. Because he does not ask for grace and he does not ask for mercy, he doesn't get it. He doesn't ask for forgiveness. He's lost. He's been with Jesus for three and a half years. He himself has gone around preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. He has had the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to heal when they sent them out two by two. And yet Jesus never had his heart. So you can't trust all of that stuff. Everything was for himself. Completely selfish. Even this final act. Completely selfish. Peter really is kind of in a place of submission. Runs away, hides, weeps. He doesn't cut himself off completely because on the day of the resurrection, we find him with John. Peter really is dealing. Judas... I can take care of this myself. I'll give the money back. You want to take it? I can't live with this. I'll take care of the torment myself. And he goes out and hangs himself. Only to enter into an eternal torment. In verse 9, there's two different prophecies actually there. He says, then was fulfilled the what was spoken of by Jeremiah the prophet saying they took 30 pieces of silver the value of him who was pierced or priced uh, whom they whom they of the children of Israel priced and in verse 10 that's the second so when it says it was spoken of or fulfilled spoken by Jeremiah the prophet actually the first part there is in Zechariah verse 10 is in Jeremiah but just learn this this week the scroll of the prophets started with Jeremiah, and often it was called the Jeremiah scroll. And Zechariah was in that scroll. 
all the prophets were listed in there in the, the minor prophets they're all in there with with in the Jeremiah scroll and then verse 10 is actually words from Jeremiah that he uh, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord had directed but the actual numbering of, of silver and all that was in Zechariah Next week, we'll see Pilate. And he's going to ask an interesting question of the Jewish leadership. What do you want me to do with Jesus, who's called the Christ? And that is the question before all of us. What are you going to do with him? What are you going to do with the one who sacrificed himself? Who was both the sacrifice and the high priest? In fact, in that verse in, in Hebrews chapter 2, when it talks about him being the propitiation, in that section, in the context of all that, talks about him being our high priest. What do you do with him? Do you carry him around as a good luck charm? Do you walk with him every day, listening for his voice? Do you spend time with him in the Bible, hearing his words? And his words are not just the letters in red. His words are from beginning to end. This is him speaking through those men. When Jesus calls you friend, like he did Judas. Is it a greeting in love, friend? Or is it, you say you're my friend. Why'd you come to me? Can we look at this and see what he did? We're, we're not even, we're not even before Pilate yet. And the self-control that is here. We still have the trials of Pilate and Herod. The scourging at the end. which by the way was intended not just as a physical punishment for that person, but it was intended as a torture to be able to pull information out of them to blame the people who were really in control. It was intended to get information. If they gave up information, the, the scourging was lessened. If they would not speak, if they wouldn't talk, it became increasingly worse. Talk about self-control. He says he didn't cry out. He didn't give anybody up. He wasn't laying there being torn apart and say, this is Glenn's fault. He just laid there and took it. He took it for you. He took it for me. And he didn't give it up. He didn't give us up. He didn't shift the blame to us. And John says the world's already condemned. He didn't come to condemn the world. The world's already condemned. He came to save the world. So if you don't know him, today's the day. Romans says, again, all who call in the name of the Lord will be saved. If you will confess Jesus is Lord. That's a submission, guys. That is not that is not just saying the words, oh yeah, Jesus is Lord. I've heard people say all the time, oh, I believe in the Lord, and they don't. It's not that. That's 
that's an acknowledgement of you need a savior and you're willing to submit to him as your Lord. To repent from your sin, to walk according to his word. A servant didn't go to his master and say, oh yeah, hey, I need a master. And then, oh, by the way, I'm going to go over here and do what I want to do. It's not what it is. It's confess that he is Lord, master. And you want to do what he wants you to do from now on. And believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. Have to believe that. Not just talk about it. You have to believe it. It's a heart thing. It takes place in the heart before it comes out of your mouth, before it comes out in action. Just like sin. Sin takes place in the heart. We saw in the Sermon on the Mount. It takes place in the heart before it comes out in word or action. But if you'll do those things, if you will submit to him as your Lord, if you will believe what the Bible says about him, you'll be saved. Seems easy. It is not. Because that self comes back up. That self says, I can be like Judas. I can fix this. I can do enough so that he can't reject me. And in doing that, you've rejected him. And you've rejected his way. It's being like Peter, being completely crushed. And not just guilty, but sorrowful for what you've done and for who you've been. So that you know he is the only way. We're going to do communion today. I almost forgot with it sitting down here instead of over here. So while the band comes and plays their last song. I will have you come and get your cup and get your piece of matzah. And I will ask you to hold it and we will take it together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for what you've done sending your son, sending Jesus to die for us. Lord, I pray that we would have a greater understanding that we would take from the pictures that you have painted in your word, we can take those and let them seep into us so that, again, we know both the horror and the beauty of what you've done. We love you. We thank you, Lord. I pray if there's any listening or any here who has never given their heart to you, Lord, that they would today. And that they would participate in the communion because of it. Because this is the symbol of your body and your blood. And Lord, I pray that if there's any who have not been walking with you, exemplifying you, trying to be like you, not, not in communion or, or in fellowship with you, that today they would submit, they would come become completely crushed as they were at the day of salvation, that they would commit to you again. Lord, you said, all who come to you, you will not turn away any. And so, Lord, I ask you to receive all of us today all who will come to you. In Jesus' name, amen.